Olá, boa tarde e bem-vindos. Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to the first session of Common Field. A three years international conference cycle co-produced by CCB, Garagem Sul and Lisbon Architecture Triennale. My name is Diana Menino. I am a Portuguese architect, co-curator of this cycle, along with the Chilean architect Felipe de Ferrari, who is in Paris right now. Common Field understands that architecture must be understood as a strategic attitude regarding space and resources. The conference program aims to discuss architecture in its most literal meaning, a collective knowledge that could be applied by everyone in any community, environment or culture through a series of mechanisms, devices, structures and forms. We claim for both critical and optimistic attitudes towards contexts, policies, briefs and clients. Architecture can appropriate reality in radical and unexpected ways from research to construction, for example, making visible its potential and contradictions and also developing projects that enable emancipatory ideas, we are able to build a common field. So our conference program will try to, f to go further on, on these ideas. Okay. Um, okay, excellent. Well, I'm going to share my screen. So you should be able to see uh, my presentation. Um, you're not going to see me for the rest of this, uh, just my voice. Um, so uh, Assemble is a collective of, uh, oh, it's hard to say, around 20 people. Um, we have a studio in London. Uh, and this is us, but quite a few years ago now, um, we've kind of lost a few members, gained a few members, and we've actually changed studios. So this was taken outside our first studio in Stratford, where we built an additional building called Yard House. And we're sitting atop this sort of timber frame. Um, and the idea behind this image was to really try and describe um, what underpins why we choose to work together in the way that we do. And that's really about kind of emulating this notion of construction, of building as a communal activity uh, where participants are um, enacting in a way their citizenship uh, through building um, cultural buildings, their homes, and this is a reference to the kind of Amish barn raising um, in America. We have done a range of projects. I'm going to run through very quickly a kind of series of things to show the sort of scale of interest and, and difference of stuff. Um, so from chairs, some very strange chairs, uh, exhibitions. This one was about Lina Bobardi, the Brazilian architect. Um, and we worked really closely with the British Council and the curator Noemi Blaja to create a kind of showcase of um, her references and ideas. We've worked with artists uh, uh, in Italy um, in this kind of installation um, at the Maxi in Rome um, and our kind of own installations in public space. Um, the big slide, <laughs> you know, kind of named quite literally, um, it's kind of more uh, self-built construction. So this is Cafe Otto, which was made entirely from um, bags of rubble uh, found on the site, um, rendered and then kind of with this plywood roof attached on top. Um, and this is a music venue where um, the cafe, which is next door, uh, is able to extend um, some of the people who perform there in the evenings by showing them and using the space in the daytime. Um, we've done kind of large scale but temporary public um, theatres um, and one of our kind of projects I suppose we're, we're very proud of, not most proud of, but very proud of is Black Horse Workshop, which is a members um, carpentry kind of school club workshop. Uh, the idea being that the wood workshop um, is as important as the local swimming pool, the local school, um, the hospital. It's a public service. It's, it should be like a library. We um, have done quite a lot of experimental stuff. Um, this was a kind of huge theatre in Parkland where 
the barn doors kind of open up into the landscape and the plays extend into the landscape. Um, and we're scaling up. So this was a competition um, we won last year uh, for a uh, small art school in um, Belgium. And we're working in collaboration with a practice called Spec Rigby. Um, so it's nice to be able to still <laughs> be a little bit part of Europe during this time. Um, and this is a kind of local brick, locally sourced brick building with a kind of timber frame insert roof that's uh, a mix of music and art studios. I'm going to talk uh, in greater depth about our first two projects. Um, the first one was called the Cinerolium. Um, it's probably the one that a lot of people who are familiar with our work uh, know. And um, it was really the project which instigated our collective collaboration within our group as a kind of a group of loosely organized friends. Uh, we were able to get hold of or get access to this site in central London, a disused petrol station, um, and transform it into a cinema. It was a temporary project. Um, it ran for five weeks in the summer of 2010. Um, and the idea was to emulate the kind of heyday of cinema going. So um, the idea being that um, we would take the iconography of, um, of cinema, but also of the petrol station, um, which was seeing a kind of massive decline, especially in inner city locations, uh, and recreate both these spaces as a place of meeting um, and of sociability where you would maybe spend time before and after the film and the film itself is not their main event. To recreate this, uh, we really drilled into the kind of symbols of the cinema, the things that you would recognize and would create that experience without literally being a real cinema. Um, so we had flip up seats made of scaffolding boards. We had an illuminated sign on the front. Um, the foyer furniture was all this marketry that was recreating images from catalogues of cinemas that we found in the Cinema Museum, an amazing uh, organization in South London who provided a lot of the imagery um, that made this project work. And we really had to be inventive. So on the right, you can see um, this kind of handmade vacuum former, which we used to shape uh, these plastic tiles, which we found in the garage of the main space of the petrol station. Um, and so I suppose the whole thing here is about transformation, how to take uh, very simple materials, very accessible and often cheap ones because their use was uh, mainly industrial so uh, to use things that can be acquired in bulk um, and often for free because the companies that were providing them were, were rather large um, and uh, make them into something that looked actually quite uh, precious in a way, elevate them. So the site itself was where everything happened. Um, it's very important that uh, we, we kind of worked visibly in the open in front of each other there weren't really, I mean, I will show in a minute a drawing, but at the time there were no drawings. It was all done through word of mouth, through on-site activity. And you can see in the bottom right here, um, a lunch, you know, like eating was very important. Um, and everything uh, was kind of happening in this sort of slightly kind of organized chaos, which maybe is the best way to sort of describe how, how we remain organized um, today. Uh, so you can see here sort of various things that would be happening in parallel. Um, and on the right is the testing of the curtain, the ruched curtain, which uh, Flint's theatrical chandlers um, came and helped us do. All the rigging for it, the mechanisms, is actually based on um, what you would use uh, in theatres but also on ships, there's a kind of synergy and history that's shared by those two um, kind of fields. So we very generously were able to work with um, Flint's, uh, who gave their time to kind of help us uh, do this. Um, and here's 
a kind of sign being erected. A lot of this timber was just found on the site, um, MDF board, which we found in the garage. Um, and the curtain, of course, which was 12 separate uh, pieces. Um, I think there was three kilometers of sewing in total and a kind of assembly line uh, developed whereby uh, different people kind of took charge of different elements. So there's a lot of finishing that had to happen, um, which you can see here. And the material we use is called Tyvek, um, it's made by DuPont, which is a, uh, a waterproof membrane that you would find um, hidden in buildings. It doesn't often get uh, a kind of outing on the exterior. Um, and after getting a lot of samples, we discovered this amazing one, which had this kind of incredible silver finish on one side, but quite what we thought was a very sophisticated matte gray on the other. Um, so it really felt like it would work um, in this context and uh, Tyvek provided a lot of it for free. Um, this, this is the promised drawing. Uh, it was actually made after we finished the project, I think it's for someone's master's portfolio or something, but you know, describing how um, scaffolding boards could be used in the most economical way um to produce a chair um the idea being or at least the idea of this drawing is about the notion that um anyone could do this uh no skills are required um it's open to everybody um and actually the kind of imagery was less important it was more about kind of creating connections on site that element of building friendships building communication um networks and talking to each other to really kind of make one vision um happen so this is the reality this is us all in the assembly line making 120 um seats and the cinema museum very generously lent us uh these cast iron velvet clad chairs which we inserted into um the rake which was a nice nod i suppose to the scaffolding board's ambition and cinema chairs uh, but also very convenient for maybe um uh elderly uh visitors to the project who were not necessarily prepared to sit through two and a half hours of metropolis on a rainy summer's evening so um that it was it was a nice addition uh, and here you can see the inside. So you can see where these vacuum form tiles ended up. Uh, we, I like to show this image because um, it really demonstrates the way in which everything that was made was included. A lot of, a lot of people do not like this image uh, because of the tiles. They think they're kind of very ugly. Um, but you know, if you made something, if there was some sort of effort in producing something, then it was included in the project. And the idea being that it was a reflection of everybody's work and everyone owned it. Um, so this is the interior during a screening and we took charge of everything. So we organized the sound, we organized the projection, the licensing, um, everything, the programming of what films to show um, was all done by the group um, and we had to kind of extend our own expertise by inviting friends who um, we knew or friends or friends who we didn't know to help. And they, uh, through turning up, through participation, became and are still part of um, what is now Assemble. Um, and so this is really the kind of device, I suppose, the trick of the whole thing. We would stand around the outside of the curtain at the end of a film and wrench it up. So the audience would suddenly be revealed to the street and become the spectacle. And there's this sort of reversal of theatricality and then everyone would disperse out into the street. Um, and so this was kind of a nice touch and I think really grounded the idea of it being a cinema into a more kind of architectural and spatial experience. Um, and at first it was a bit dodgy. You can see here one curtain's a bit lower than the others, but by the end we, really, we were really seamless um, with this. Um, and here you can see the, the kind of effect um, during an evening performance. And so our second project was really an extension, fully for a flyover, same idea, take an empty site, a site that is unused, a site that is seemingly overlooked or undervalued, um, and transform it. So we built a small timber structure. Um, the structure we described as a folly. 
Um, and the idea is really based on this narrative, this fiction of a nail house. Um, some of you might be kind of aware of these uh, images of small houses where huge pieces of infrastructure are kind of built around them. And we wanted to kind of retroactively apply this, um, this kind of story to describe why the, this flyover may have split in this way. It was kind of inexplicable. We never quite worked out how. Um, some, the traffic is going in two different directions. And so we came up with this idea that there had been a house there before. And when the road was built, it had to split around it and thereby creating a kind of fictional uh, idea behind, behind the infrastructure um, of the space. Um, the idea for the bricks came from um, the contextual uh, kind of setting uh, where a lot of sort of still actually industrial, but kind of ex-industrial buildings, a lot of artist studios in this area. It's in East London in Hackney Wick on the fringe of the Olympic Park. Um, and a lot of them were going out of business. But I suppose the sort of interesting twist in this one is that all the bricks are made out of timber. So we went to Ashwell uh, Timber Yard in Essex and cut down all of the bricks into, um, well, lengths of timber into bricks, um, which were then drilled in two places. This one shows the Jarrah, which is a very, very tough uh, uh, red timber, which is also um, very smelly. So it had this kind of dual issue that it was very hard to drill and also really unpleasant to drill. Um, but we had to get on and drill to 12,000. Um, and you can see here the way in which each brick was then strung uh, through rope and then tied back to a scaffolding frame. So it kind of acted like a curtain. It was, it was all a fiction. It was all a bit of a stage set, really. Um, again, some organized chaos on site as uh, each type of timber, I think we had about five or six different types, um, had to be kind of applied to this wall in a in a random fashion, which is kind of harder to make happen than you might think. Um, and so everyone developed their own kind of bits of expertise, their own bits of ownership. And again, the model was invite everyone down. Um, people who turned up were part of the project, whether they were there for 10 minutes for the day or for the duration of the build. We then ran it as a cafe. Um, and we tied it into the Barbican, an institution in London, an arts institution, cultural institution, who had a film screening. Um, so we were like their satellite venue. And I really enjoy this image on the left um, because it really demonstrates how the project enabled things to happen, which previously were thought of as impossible. So it shows a very young girl, the kind of archetypal white blonde girl in her best dress, playing literally on the floor of this site with some found objects, um, which are kind of leftover building materials. And as you can see, the building is very much a backdrop. The building allows, it legitimizes this practice, this behavior. This girl is not obviously being kind of looked after by anybody. Um, yet what is she, what she's doing here could have been done without the building. It could have just been done when the site was empty. Um, and so really the important thing is not so much the building, but the public space, the building legitimized. So you can see here an image taken from the structure looking outwards where a brass band, the East London brass band paid a concert for free. You can see them all sitting, we didn't even have enough chairs, they're sitting on piled up flagstones that were left over from building the floor um, uh, to an audience of passers-by, of people who were just there for the afternoon. And um, you can see the way in which the site could be used positively, communally, um, and for quite unusual uh, uh, activities. Um, and that felt very meaningful in this context where a lot of local um, uh, things had lost funding, had lost space. It was the height of, or the beginnings even, of austerity measures in the UK in 2011. Um, and so really the idea was that by making a lot of things public, we were demonstrating um, that this area has a really rich community um, and that development would only um, move out people who were all very much, very much there 
even though perhaps the area itself has quite a kind of industrial feel to it and it's not clear that there are people living there. Um, so I'm going to kind of whiz through uh, our studios because as I sort of described, the sites were really important in our first two projects. We only really existed when we had a site. We designed the projects, we built them, we troubleshooted <laughs> on site. And so um, as we started to formalize as a group, not having a site was a real challenge. How do we do what we do or what we thought we do without a site? Um, so when we acquired some space uh, for our first studio, the first thing we did was in a way kind of build a site. We had just a main space where all the tools were accessible um, in this tool wall. It's a open access in a way thing uh, that houses everything that we own basically um, and our studio is now shared and open to a number of other makers carpenters metal workers um, uh, ceramicists even a stonemason at one point and all of our tools were accessible to them and you can see that sort of door on the left is was the entrance to our our office space and we extended this idea um, and built yard house which is this kind of brightly clad building um, and it provided studio space for a range of people. What we really learned from our first two projects was that this desire to build was great, but really all it could do would, would be really kind of educational for us as designers. Um, we were unlikely to really be the real fabricators of a lot of our work uh, because there are skilled people who do that job a whole ton better, <laughs> dedicate their lives to it even. So, our model is really about practicing in close proximity with um, people who are doing kind of exciting stuff. So we built a house for them, basically, and all the money went on the front, as you can see. Um, the idea being that yards in this area of East London was really where the kind of main activity happens. And um, this very lean structure financially um, uh, was quite dumb. And what it allowed is um, for us to uh, create a social space in this yard, something that really um, kind of brightened it and made it a place you'd want to have events. And so that's what we did. Um, again, lots of tiles uh, made by uh, Molly King, one of our artists. Um, and again, trying to create a kind of semi random pattern uh, on the front. Um, and we unfortunately had to leave that studio about three years ago and have moved into what was an old school in South London. So this was actually the swimming pool of the school. And you can see the timber columns kind of shooting into the floor. Uh, so that's the swimming pool they're going into. Um, and uh, this uh, space is now housing a lot of artists. You can see here on the right, ceramicist studio. Um, and again, kind of communality, eating together, making together really kind of underpins the culture of how we work. And again, um, here is a small structure that Assemble designed for one of the carpenters, uh, Daniel Kiesel. He built it. And so uh, because we share a space, we're able to, with Dan, design the details, see it being made. Um, and uh, in that way, there's much more of a kind of collaborative aspect to the kind of whole thing. So we like this kind of thing. Uh, we're able to work at, with models a lot. Um, so from this scale to this scale and invite people into our studios. So this is Matt Raw, a ceramicist. Um, and he really helped us develop a project in uh, Northeast London, um, which was about making tiles um, as a cladding. And you can hit, see here a range of tests and Matt Raw's expertise were crucial to creating something that was of an architectural standard from, for an exterior cladding, um, designing details, uh, getting the right mix so there would be consistency. Um, turns out yellow and green are the cheapest pigments. And these tiles were used to clad a small, um, which is a kind of coffee kiosk. So again, it's the same idea in a way as with Yard House, where do you put the money in? Where do you put the effort? How do you make something feel special and unusual and unique? And because we have this studio, um, we're able to create bespoke ha handmade tiles for a very small project rather than uh, you know specify off the shelf.
uh, things. Um, so I thought I'd also just show how that scales up. Goldsmiths is our largest project to date. Um, it is sort of like renovation in a way, but also insertion of two new structures into a bath, Victorian bathhouse. Um, the students of the fine art program at Goldsmiths University are currently uh, situated in the swimming pools, uh, another swimming pool uh, inhabitation. Um, and so adjacent is the old um, uh, water tanks and kind of back of house. And our proposal, we won this through competition, was to think about this as a family of curated spaces where we would just be carving out what was already there, um, but also inserting these two new, um, two new structures that kind of provide that contemporary art setting. We worked through a lot of one to 20 models to understand the way in which these two things would meet. Um, and also at one-to-one. -one. So we were able um, to take the cladding package out of the contract and using a stained cement board, um, deliver something that maybe was slightly more bespoke than what was made uh, possible within the budget. Um, and so here is a one-to-one -one test where kind of all sorts of details are being worked out. Um, and this is a kind of interior um, and we then extended that. We made the welcome desk, we made lamps, we made a, developed a chair. Um, the project was really enabled by a client that really was interested in taking risks and really understood this building as a kind of once in a, I don't know, sort of university style, lifetime uh, opportunity to create something kind of quite unusual for both the students, but also um, as a place that would welcome artists internationally. And so I'm just going to end on uh, Granby Four Streets, which is the project for which we, um, it sounds disingenuous to say for which we won the Turner Prize, but was uh, attracted the attention of the Turner Prize judges. Um, and it was work we were doing and still are doing in Liverpool, a city in the Northwest of England, uh, home to very diverse population. It has the most diverse population in the UK. Um, which also has a very difficult history, uh, particularly the race riots, the 1980s. Um, and through a series of various complicated initiatives, um, which uh, were caused by both Conservative and the new Labour government, um, a lot of uh, the area was left looking like this. Um, it's very typical not just in Granby, the area in which these photos are taken from, but from the wider uh, urban um, south part of Liverpool. Uh, so this would be a typical street. It's like this today. And we were able to work with the Community Land Trust, which is a form of organization in which the community own land um, and are able to then sell or rent um, the building on top. So the idea being that they never lose their equity in um, the area because the land is held in trust in perpetuity and cannot be sold beyond the community. So the CLT were able to acquire um, 10 buildings. They were in this kind of state. Um, this was really the culmination of decade, decades and decades of activism on their part before we even met them. Um, where they really developed a sense of humour around what, around what was happening. Um, they, again, they, they started painting houses um, and they started greening the area to really demonstrate that there were people still living in some of these buildings and that they cared for and wanted um, to stay and to see uh, the streets brought back in as for residential use. So, Greening is a real um, important part of their resistance and a visible part, you know, the care it takes to keep this um, kind of life visible uh, demonstrates their, the significance of their lives. Um, and it's inside and outside the buildings. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, the market's a really important part of, of life there. Um, it's monthly on a Saturday and it brings people from all over Liverpool to Granby just for this uh, kind of one event. So we um, tried to create a series of interventions which celebrated 
some of the misfortune of the structures. So where a ceiling had fallen down, instead of building a flat ceiling in, we created a kind of pitched roof interior, uh, which allowed for some ingenuity in terms of the kind of spatial constraints of these old structures, but also recognize or speak to the history of what had happened there um, before and not overwrite um, the kind of three decades of struggle. Yet the houses seem to actually, in a very lean fit out, become quite dull, um, quite clean, very nice, great, people can live there, uh, but didn't really feel like they spoke to, I suppose, some of what we'd experienced by being in people's houses in Liverpool, uh, namely um, this amazing inhabitation. So this is Hazel's house, Hazel is on the right, she's a member of the CLT, and the building, um, her home, very much kind of uh, speaks to this kind of idiosyncrasy and character. So we set up Granby Workshop to create products for the houses, which we could deliver, um, including taking a kind of standard white 15 uh, by 15 tile and creating decorative decals on it. Um, and Granby talks about the house as a site of making, and so we made a lot of stuff in the house, uh, terrazzo that went into fireplaces, um, this kind of shed, makeshift shed that, that became the space of production. These fireplaces were installed in the homes. They're made from the rubble of the gardens in Granby. Smoke uh, fired slip cast ceramics done in a barbecue. So like really simple DIY homemade stuff uh, that could elevate um the the fit out so you can see here the tiles in the bathroom and then how we displayed them at the um turner price uh, and this is a kind of showroom of things so i'm just going to finally <laughs> just show you some images granby winter garden because this was really the project that enabled us to um i suppose realize some more of the like social aspirations this is a community space that is in two of the disused buildings, which were too far gone. Um, and we made that first image um, to try and get funding to renovate the houses, but we didn't then have the money to actually do the Winter Garden. And it was only as a result of the Turner Prize win um, that people were suddenly interested in this. You know, they'd turn up on the streets and be like, which one's the art? Um, so there's this quite interesting tension and I suppose issue about the way in which um, projects like this are kind of fetishized maybe from a design perspective and are actually an ongoing part of people's uh, lived experience and struggle. Again, we work with models to sort of describe the aspirations for the space. Um, and we work with a structure workshop, really amazing engineers who do a lot of art stuff, uh, develop this kind of steel ring beam to hold, uh, brace the structures. Um, and this is the kind of opening moment where everyone came um, and the space is, you know, it's kind of quite self-explanatory, but it has an artist residency space so someone can stay there. Um, the local community can rent it out um, through Airbnb to generate revenue to maintain the space. But it also has this kind of room where the CLT and local people can uh, use to meet as groups. Um, this is just a really nice photo I thought I'd end on um, showing this kind of opening moment um, and the way in which we hope this project is used going forward. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the symbol. Um, bit of a whirlwind, I'm sorry, but um, I just want to say thanks to uh, the Lisbon Triennial, to Diana, uh, Felipe and everyone else back of house. Um, who are organising this stream um, and for the invitation. I'm really sad we can't do it in person, but uh, maybe next time. Thank you very much to you, Jane. Actually, perhaps before to continue, I will, I will just uh, come back to the, this brief introduction for the ones who couldn't hear uh, my words before. Actually, following Diana's uh, presentation, introduction, to build up a common field requires to assess the idea of common sense, a critical concept in the present context of uh, global neoliberalization, political decay, uh, decay, and by consequence, social transformation in many places. 
This is why we believe a radical architectural project is not only desirable, but, but, but really needed. Such projects can be conceived by, a, by an accumulative process of constant appropriation, imitation, repetition, translation, and recontextualization with open mind uh, and generous thinking uh, based on, careful, uh, on a careful review of material reality and social conditions. Common Field Conference Program actually will go further on this idea, at least this is our, our attempt. Uh, just before to introduce uh, Barbara Busser from Bauburo in situ, I would like to come back to the biography by, by Jane. Actually, Jane uh, completed a PhD at the Royal College of Art, uh, of Art back in 2018, where her research looked at the legacy of modernist architects in both UK and, and Brazil. She is the inaugural recipient of the British Council in Abobardi Fellowship uh, in 2013, and founding member of the London Architecture Collective, you already know, uh, founded in 2010. Uh, Assemble, Assemble Work uh, won the Turner Prize in 2015, and Jane is also the author of the book Breaking Ground Architecture by Women, published by Fidon uh, last year. So thanks again, Jane, and we continue now with the biography of uh, Barbara Busser. Barbara is a Swiss architect with a Master of Architecture from ETH Zurich and a Master of Advanced Studies in Energy Engineering from University of Applied Science and Art, Northwestern Switzerland. In 88, she co-founded the architectural practice Bauburo Mitte, afterwards renamed as Bauburo in situ, together with Eric Honegger. Basser is also Busser, sorry, is also founder and partner of Denstad, a think tank specialized in project development in urban and rural contexts, as well as of Kantensprung, a company that has transformed a four machine factory into a popular community center in the area of Gundeldingen in Basel. Since October 14, uh, 14 she has been transforming the Marktale Basel, a market dome next to Basel main train station into a live, lively platform for alimentation. So welcome, Barbara. The, you can start your presentation now. Thank you for being here. Hello, everybody. Boa noite a todos. Estou muito contenta de dar esta conferência. Estou muito triste de não poder vir a Lisboa. Um, vou mudar a, a falar inglês como foi combinado. Um, I have prepared a small presentation for you. Oh, oh, oh don't go so fast. No. <laughs> next, yes. Bring me the next picture. Yeah. I want to talk to you about reutilization and upcycling. In Switzerland, we are producing 17 million tons of waste, construction waste only, and this is in no way sustainable. We cannot go on like this. We don't even know where to put the waste, and we are really spo uh, spoiling resources when we are doing new construction. A lot has been done to reduce the energy consumption during the operation of a building, but almost nothing has been done regarding the construction of buildings. And this is where we started to act. And with our latest building, we found out that we can save up to 50% of the CO2 by using used building materials. Reuse is part of the circular economy and it starts with the construction but we don't start only with new element, but we start from what is there in a town when we build a new house. There's always something there. The, the towns are built. We are not living on the green space. We are not building on the outside the towns only, but we are building in the towns and there we have to demolish first something. And this is what we are working against. We think that Everything which is existing has already emitted its CO2. If we keep it rather than throwing it away and buy all these new things, we are making a contribution. 
And this is the contribution towards climate or against climate change that we can do as architects. Next bit, picture, please. I want to talk to you about four, yeah, reuse on four levels. We can reuse sites like the Elshish factory in Lisboa or like this factory I show you here, Hanro, which is a text tree, or the building underneath, which is a normal office building. We can reuse buildings, we can reuse building elements, and we can reuse materials. I want to start with the next picture. Next. Next picture, please. I want to show you a few of the factories we have transformed. It's now, it was a bit too fast, never mind. The first was Gundeldinger Feld. The picture which, uh, oh, now I think I have two different kinds of presentations. Okay. Yeah, Gundeldinger Feld, right. This is the factory which is near to us and we started the reutilization 20 years ago. We were able to find investors who bought the land for us and they gave it us a leasehold for 90 years. 20 years are passed and we have transformed the whole area into a lively neighborhood center. The next picture. This is an old brewery which was supposed to be pulled down and the resistance of the neighbors who had lost all the cases, but at the end they won because they had fought during eight years for the, keeping these buildings up so that the original investors got tired and they didn't want to realize their project anymore once they were allowed to. Next. This is an old aluminium pressing factory which was completely left over. The buildings are of very bad quality. And instead of repairing a roof, for example, we just built two floors on top with reuse of materials, which was just lying around. Next, I want to show you or explain to you a few strategies for the reutilization of old factory sites. We'll have a treasure map, we talk about participation, we talk about a one-to-one -one model, we talk about spectacular spaces, new use similar to the old use and changes in volume. Next. The first thing we do when we get to a new old factory, we try to explore the treasures of the site and we note it on a treasure map. For example, we try to define the characteristics of the site. That was too fast, sorry. We try to see what can the building do? What are the skills, so say skills of a building? What is the charm of the building? What is important to preserve? And we also take note of the mood of the site, of this color scheme, for example, of the patina. Next. And very important, as Jane does as well, we try to understand the needs of the place through participation. In a participatory process, we ask the neighborhood, the surroundings and the region, what is the history of this place? And what is needed now at that area? We try to set a theme for the site Either it can be the old function of the site, like a brewery, or it can be something new. And we develop together with the people ideas for the future use. Next. Here we see the dome, which Felipe mentioned. The dome, which is was a, a market and which is now a street market for food and drinks again. 
Here it was empty because it was wrongly devised. The people had to pay too much. They were not able to keep up their small shops and we had to transform the whole thing into a lively neighborhood again. The fascinating thing is that when you work in an existing building, you have like a one-to-one -one model. And the built space, of course, is the best place to imagine different new utilizations. We are therefore working on site and our office is also called in situ, which means on site in order to get to know the existing space and to facilitate the introduction of new utilizations. We can see the sun, where it comes from, we can hear the traffic, we can hear the rain and see where the roof leaks. And then we can devise our new utilization. Next. The old sites also have a potential of spectacular spaces. In industrial buildings, we often find especially high rooms. We find large or tiny rooms. We find dark or very bright rooms. And such unusual rooms are really precious and they mark the character of a site. Nowadays, we would not be able financially to build such spaces anymore. Next. And therefore, we say that the new use should be very similar as much as similar as possible to the original use because construction especially in switzerland is very expensive as you build the cheaper the rent will be at the end so we favor small interventions we favor starting from the treasure map which i mentioned at the beginning we see first what is there what can we reuse Next, just a short abstraction. When we have a volume, we can change it in many ways. We don't need to demolish it. We can, for example, if the room is high, we can divide it with an additional floor. If the building is very low, we can add a floor. If it's not as big as the site, we can add sideways or in front or in the back. We can but also work with subtraction. We can take a facade off. We can take a whole building off in between two. Or we can build only an atrium in the middle so that we have more light and, and uh, air and better working spaces in between. Next. One important thing for us is that we really treasure the patina. Sometimes we, we prohibit people from painting because once you start painting, a wall looks fresh, but then what about the window in this newly painted wall? What about the doors? Then you start painting everything and your patina is gone. And with the, ex with the insulation, we always have the problem that we have to destroy the patina on one side. And we choose either the outside, as we add an insulation on the outside, or we insulate on the inner side. We, rarely there is a space in between where we can fill up with insulation, which is the best thing which, when we don't see it. But mostly we have to make a decision. Next. Now we go forward to new constructions. New constructions with used construction element with reused materials. What are the strategies we apply to transform these sites while maintaining their unique characteristics? The most important is we start from the existing. Remember treasure map. And what we find in the neighborhood, we can add it. We don't want long transport ways because that also uses up CO2, but we work with what we find in the neighborhood. And then mainly it needs to be flexible with your planning. You start on one side and then you find really a nice material 
So you have to start afresh or you have to integrate this material into your planning. And you have to build with tolerances. I will show you what this means in picture. I'll show you two examples. One is TP215, an ex-distribution center for food and wine in Basel. There we have been able to upcycle materials to form a facade of 100 by 10 meters, means 100 square meters, 1000, sorry, square meters, all made from reused materials. The start was that we were looking for windows because if you make a plan of a facade and you say, oh, the window has to be 2 meter 20 by 183, you will never find the matching window. If you so look for the window first and then you draw your plan, there is no problem. We were looking for timber beans. We were looking for insulation material, which is normally soft and can be cut into size to and we were looking for metal sheets. Next, this is the site we are talking about. On your right side, you see a building which we could conserve for the next 30 years and which had an open site which we needed to close with this new facade. And because the authorities considered it uh, intermediate use, 30 years only, they allowed us to use recycled material. My colleague, André from Portugal, took the phone and he rang all the window companies in the neighborhood, asking them for leftovers, for offcuts and so on. And here you see what he got. Within one week, he was given 200 windows, all of different sites sizes. He made a big drawing and then he started to make a puzzle. Next picture. Next. Uh, which picture are you on? Yeah, this is the, uh, the windows, the 200 windows, all drawn meticulously. And now the next is the puzzle which André was drawing. He was trying to arrange the windows so that it makes sense for the functions. But the owner was not happy with this puzzle. He wanted a more rhythmic facade, and you, which you see now already. And we combined this, an element with a window with an element with metal sheets so that from far you don't realize how diverse the facade is. Next picture. Then we went to look for timber. And can you imagine in Switzerland, people are pulling down a thing like this. Perfect, clean timber, only 14 years old. We brought it to the woodworker, to the factory. They cut it to size and glued it together to the dimension we needed. With this timber, we constructed our frames and you see here, next picture, you see the frames, which were, ah, the, oh, sorry. These are the cut, the timbers, and cut and glued to size on the right side. Next picture. With this timber, we constructed the frames, and each frame has the same size of 3 meter 50 by 10 meters, which can be transported on the road, but it encloses the different windows. Next. Here you see the windows fitted in and the rest of the surface is filled up with cutoffs from insulation. Next. The next step was to close the facade to close this insulation. Unfortunately, we didn't find at that time gypsum panels which could be used, but we had to buy new ones. Now we have already a source of also cutoffs from gypsum for the next time. 
Next, the elements were packed and put on a transporter and brought to the site and mounted on the next picture. You see how they closed this facade, which you have seen open in the beginning, within a few days, and we could start to work in the warm inside of the house. We then finished the outside with this metal cladding and it's also, you see, it's not completely green, it's washed a bit, it has a patina, it is old from the same site. So the color matches with the existing buildings, which were not new. Next, there was also a courtyard and there we have been allowed to show more of this puzzle of the different windows and you see that there is not not two of the same size they are all different and you also see the three floors more or less cover which these walls these elements are covering the most beautiful view is from the inside where you can see again this puzzle and it makes a um, picture on its own so this was the facade of about 1000 square meters the next example I would like to show you is an ex sulzer factory in Winterthur. And there we decided to go even further. And lucky enough, we had the support of the owner of the building who allowed us to build everything with old construction elements, with old material, provided it was not more expensive than a new construction. And this was a very, very tough condition. With the reuse, we can save all the embodied energy in these construction elements and materials. We have at the end not been able to make it with 100% reuse, but with this 80% reuse materials, we can save 50% of the CO2 as compared to a new construction. We reduced considerably the construction waste. We haven't calculated yet how much it is. And we are economizing resources through this way of construction. Next. You see the building, which was supposed to be um, at three floors were supposed to be added. The out facade, the existing facade, is a very thin brick facade, 12 centimeters only, and we decided to put the insulation in on the inner side. We wanted really to test the boundaries. We started with 100% reuse, and we end up probably now with 70%, but only due to the condition that is not supposed to cost more than a new construction. We could find electric cables, kilometers of electric cables, but it take, it's cost too much to salvage them and to reutilize them. But it would be possible without problem. Next picture. So this is what we imagine, how we imagine this uh, building to look like. And we started to look for windows again. We looked for metal sheets we looked for a whole staircase and we found it within 50 kilometers of the construction site we found even more and we made a picture of that and the architecture museum liked it so much that they asked us to make an exhibition even before we even constructed the metal beams you see here are taken from the first example. We had already an advance, of course, because we knew this is going to be demolished and we saved the metal beams right away. And this is how we started our design. We had the primary construction material and we tried to fit it on this existing building. Next. We also found the metal sheets. This time they were not green, but red. So we told the authorities, maybe it will be red, the building, maybe it will be blue, maybe green. We don't know yet. And they were really generous and said, okay, you just make your 
ask you for your permit and you put what is most likely to be and if the color changes then you give us another plan next we found windows big windows just in the neighborhood where this hall which you see has been demolished so at least we have the identity of the place saved and uh, like a memory built in into the new building we laid out again all the windows we could get and tried to make the puzzle on how to use them here they are prepared for the reuse and this is another problem which i do not want to explore but just to mention it's the time scale you normally don't get the material you need at the time you need it so you must have an intermediate storage and the best is to prepare things already for transport when you have them so you can call them when you need them on the construction site it took about one and a half year in advance to starting collecting the materials we needed and this was more or less in within one and a half year we found free of charge all the material we needed for this six-story building next then we prepared for the architectural museum this sort of a exploded mock-up where you see now the red metal panels the aluminium windows the frames of timber and this time we use straw for the insulation it takes a bit more space because the values are not as good as mineral wool but we had the space so we tried to use this it's also a reuse of a material from the agricultural field this is the other side where we show the windows the doors we found the tiles from brazilian granite which we had to cut into these uh, smaller tiles so that we can make the floor with it they were on a facade before next and here all the small details which we were collecting and exhibiting before they are now built in into this new old building again there are the metal beams coming from basel being built up on this old structure and because the size didn't really fit it just uh, comes out a little bit like a balcony because we didn't want to cut them which is more work and unnecessary and it gives a few more square meters to the building next you see we have built up three floors out of beams then we found other metal sheets to make a shuttering formwork for the concrete floor which is put on top of the beams next picture yep these are the shutters and on the next we put them up on the beam structure next we fill the concrete in of course recycling concrete this does not really save a lot of co2 but it saves a deposit space and this is how the rooms look at the moment we are building up with uh, clay and the straw you don't already don't see it anymore and we have found wooden panels to make the inner walls next and we even found the staircase which is absolutely fantastic it fits about it, uh, it uh, only two centimeters we have to correct otherwise it fits exactly the measures we need and in uh, next spring we are expecting to finish the building and i would like to invite you all to come and have a look if uh, hopefully by then we are allowed to travel again so this is the are the three examples i wanted to show you and um, i hope you have a lot of questions 
and I really hope to see you once on our site so that we can show you the experience which is really very demanding but very rewarding as well. Thank you very much. Thank you both Thank you Jane and Barbara, both, for, Jane and Barbara for, for this uh, generous and very pedagogical presentations. Uh, let's have a break of a couple of minutes and we come back with the discussion and then the questions by the audience for sure. Hi everyone again. Uh, we will now continue the dialogue with both uh, Jane and Barbara. I will open the discussion with a brief general commentary and then just a couple of questions. Um, and in the meantime, Diana will be selecting some some of your questions and ideas by yeah by the audience. And so please take advantage of this uh, moment of uh, having the possibility to, to to discuss or to and to exchange some ideas with the with both uh, Jane and, and Barbara. So we are back. Thank you again, both Barbara and Jane. The presentations were super, super interesting. Taking, we see several, a lot of similarities, of course, that's why you, you, you are here introducing your work today. But then just before to, yeah, to open the discussion for the whole audience, I will just, I would like just to, uh, comment something about your your presentations. Both of you uh, introduced your practice strategic and collaborative approaches while also examining the role of the architects as mediators within a complex uh, process uh, of transformation, including the interplay, the interplay of profitability and financing, planning and construction, communication and participation, and so on and so forth in, in every scale and, and in every possibility. So, First question is about time. Um, both practices, both Assemble, Assemble and Bauboro in situ, are well known for their strong engagement in different phases of each project, even after they are built, something not, something not really usual in the field of architecture. Could you, could you expand your specific role in the later phases of some of your projects, including their programming time? Shall I talk first? Um, for us, it's different in every in every project. For example, the market hall, we are the operators. We have signed the contract for the next next ten years, so we are responsible <laughs> for paying the rent to the owner of the building. We are responsible for all the men, the changes we make. We are responsible for the tenants we have. And uh, this is a real heavy role, but that's why we made a separate company who is taking care of that. But me and my partner, Eric, we are always together in these companies also, but with different people. We could not handle all these projects if we had not such very, very good teams who are working on their own without us giving orders, for example. We are discussing where we want to go and they propose and they do and we meet maybe once a month and we discuss when there are heavy problems like now. We are trying to make an increasement of the capital and there, of course, we have to be part of it. But for the daily operations, we do not participate. Or the other example of Gundlinger Feld, we also created a separate entity, which is a Limitada, and um, we are five people there, Eric and me again, and another architect. Then there's a veterinary doctor and a musician part of this company, and even this company also operates separately. And it has this 90 year contract. So we are also talking about who will be our successors, how do we find them, how will it be financed in the future, and so on. You're so lucky that you have a 90-year contract. Well, we do the same thing, but often, uh, you know, sort of struggle to really get uh, longevity. Um, most of the reason, I suppose, a lot of our projects, we continue our involvement, is about ensuring that they do survive. So. Uh, when it's often hard to find funding um, for new organizations, 
securing space, especially when a lot of what we seem to have dealt with up until this point involves interim use. Um, you know, you're on kind of like five, 10 year phases and cycles. And so as soon as you're in a building, you need to start looking for the next one. So um, we have this issue. And I think a lot of our projects, I suppose it comes back to this notion of architecture focusing very much on the object being object obsessed. So I think when people talk about a project or refer to a project, they're referring to the object that is produced. Um, when actually for us, a project involves brief writing. We've recently actually, we do a lot of just advising people on how to organize in order to get what would be understood as a project off the ground. So it's a lot of hand holding and guiding right through to setting up boards for projects, trustees, business planning, um, extending mm -hmm. beyond that kind of final built thing. Um, so we sit on the board for two different projects that we've set up, a playground in Scotland and a uh, the members workshop, Black Horse um, in North London. So we're still, still talking to and, and helping out and supporting the communities. Um, but I think there's something that's really important there, which is about also independence. It's not helpful if we hang around a lot. <laughs> I think these things have to survive independently and be taken um, uh, ownership by others for them to have meaningful value. Um, so it's the kind of like popping our heads up, making ourselves visible when we're needed and then disappearing. <laughs> I think we still have to learn about the disappearing. <laughs> we are not yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we have no choice because we cannot take on board new projects if we still hang around with all the old ones. But we can learn yeah, from yeah. you there. <laughs> Definitely, and, and actually, for uh, after this question, let's talk a little bit more about money because you somehow both of you already talk a, a little bit, but actually. It seems that both Assemble and Bauburo in situ have a, have a lot of experience actually in, 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 in both designing the brief, as uh, paraphrasing 51 and 40, for example, and the search for self-commissions actually. You move freely, you seem to move quite freely as designers, mediators and entrepreneurs. Could you tell us a bit more about the last one, which is probably the most interesting one for perhaps the audience, which we know that uh, Architects normally are usually good designers, but not really, not really good, perhaps dealing with uh, economy. So, could you tell us a little bit more about this, about your experience taking part of the risks, and how how does it mean? And if you can just give a kind of brief, brief example. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose architects are entrepreneurs. Maybe they don't like to recognize it, but most architects are small business owners um or very large business owners and uh the economics of what you do has very little to do with design it's quite prosaic it's about good administration resourcing <laughs> moving labor around um and in a way we began with that before we began with design so our entire practice was based on how do you organize labor on a construction site the design kind of comes secondary. So yeah, um, in a way, we've always had to be quite entrepreneurial uh, to enable us to maintain this way of working. So in finding a space, our first space, Sugar House Studios, that main space with all our tools where we made things, actually for the first few years of its life was a nightclub and a cinema and a cafe. We had a pizza oven, people were running a running all sorts of things and there's very little architecture that seemed to get done um but i think it was also a time when we weren't quite sure what it is we were doing and all of that activity seemed to be part of thinking about um the life of spaces we were less concerned with designing um in a more formal sense and i think as we've got older that interest has grown um and really studio space is where the kind of entrepreneurial side of our practice comes from we are we are workspace operators um and whilst that's a really great subsidy on the design practice um that's the kind of economic reality 
uh, it also allows us to take care of 50 other makers and independent small creative businesses in central London. So when we move studio, we don't just take a symbol, we take 50 other people. We're kind of a mini sort of like union of, of makers. And we're really trying to negotiate how that's viable in inner city conditions, which we think is really important. And at the moment, unfortunately, we're dealing with interim use space. This is really not ideal. We understand ourselves as complicit in maybe creating um, a kind of cultural hub in this, these large scale construction developments where a lot of kind of cultural capital is being generated by us for on behalf of the developer. Um, so the strategy I think we're interested in is how can this economic model really be used to disrupt development cycles in the city? But that's maybe a different question, answer for a different question. <laughs> Very interesting, I have to say, but Barbara, mm -hmm. please. Yeah, I think my uh, economic uh, entrepreneurship started in Africa. I've been working about 10 years in the development corporation and I've never gained earned so much money as I did there tax free. <laughs> and so when I came back, I had uh, some reserves and I could invest into two years work. Uh, and that's when I founded the Bautal Börse, this a store for construction elements toilets and wash basins and um, wooden beams and tiles, floor tiles, everything. And that's where our, our adventure started because then in Switzerland, the jobless rate was growing higher and higher and people, the authorities were paying us to occupy the people, to give them a, a sort of a day um, program so that they don't hang around. And we started our our basis with this, we had the free work of these people. We had to organize them. We had to train them for the official uh, market, job market. And we could build with them. We built up our first houses, our first stores, our first maker spaces. And then we went on and on. And we are trying to, our aim is to operate all the companies we have on a non-profit basis. And this gives us a, a space where a reserve where we, which we can invest into the next project. Uh, because in Switzerland, everybody wants to make profit and we don't make profit, but we can use that profit and reinvest it into the next, in the next uh, social adventure. Great. I don't know if you already have some questions in mind, Diana. Uh, well, I'm um, sorry, I, I, I'm always looking at the side because I have another screen with the with the chat, but but now I I put the, the chat here on my screen. Uh, I'm sorry, actually I lost it. Ah, okay. Uh, so um, we have two questions here, and I'm I'm going to I'm going to read it, read it from Anna Fernandes. Let's say, um, how much would you say that anarchist thinking and the work of anarchist architects, such as Colin Ward in James' case and Ed Widmer in Barbara's case, for instance, uh, influences your practices? It's for both in that case. Can you repeat how much anarchism does influence our project? In short. In short, they were they were talking about anarchist architects, but then, in short, it's about anarchism. As, uh... I, uh, okay, I can listen you. Did you listen me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. But it's not easy to answer. We, you want to start, oh, okay. <laughs> Is there a relationship in between this uh, kind of th thinking or, or understanding of the society and your practices, or is it totally it goes in a kind of separate, uh, total uh, different way? Or 
Let's say I have never analyzed it in this way, but uh, we always ask people, is it a law or is it a prescription or what? what is it? Is it just common sense? And we really act according to common sense, even if it is against the law or trying to find a way around, because all what the laws prescribe to us is very, very expensive. So if we don't need to really comply, and we try to go around, but it's not really because we want to be anarchists, but because we want to make projects possible, which are, if you calculate normally, and if you do everything the law prescribes, it makes the project impossible. So that's a sort, I think there's a, a small sense of anarchism in the way we are working, but we have never discussed it. It has never been declared that way. We are put into the corner of alternative green leftists, but anarchists never, anybody called me an anarchist. I wouldn't mind though. <laughs> is it, is, is yeah. it comfortable for, for, for you, Barbara, this label? I say, I, I have to think about it, what it really means. I don't, <laughs> I don't know, but for as spontaneously, I would say, no, it's fine for me. If it means that you do apply your common sense and not the law on the first level, then I would say yes. What about you, Jane? Thank you. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, I could only wish that we could describe ourselves as anarchists. I mean, as far as political ideologies I go, go I'd say, like, we are pretty weak. Um, I think what, as a group of people, we do collectively is more of, I would say, a kind of like Brechtian notion of um, kind of disrupting things. So if, if anarchism is about disrupting things, then sure. But really it's about, I suppose, working with in um, existing power structures to try and upend them and create new relationships for how, I suppose, resources, materials, labor, funding is distributed and who, who controls that. Um, and I think that's a kind of incremental everyday fight. I'd say what we are interested in is more around um, organizing different forms of resistance um i don't think we sit outside of or define uh or are able to exist outside of existing um kind of systems and structures in fact we're complicit with them um and with it as a group of 20 people we actually all come from very different political backgrounds i personally wish we were more united uh in that sense or felt we could practice in a more radical way. I think actually, actually, this kind of notion that what we do is alternative can be quite dangerous. We're a business, we pay ourselves, we have salaries, we have employees, um, we have families, we're doing all those normal, normal things, um, conventional things. And um, I think maybe the ways in which we work are seen as alternative, or maybe anarchists because they're trying to upend these power structures but the business of it all the practice of it all is, is very conventional um and i think it would be a mistake to try and label it in a way that is somehow um different from what other people are already doing we're 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 within a discourse of of every day i think all architects deal with the same things that we do so we can all be anarchists together <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, let me see another one. Um, from Tiago Trigo. What is the role of representation to mobilize participation, to show the building, the treasure and its potential and problems? How does architectural representation can be a key or an obstacle to engage the users? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, maybe Jane, 
first? And yeah. No, that's a great question. And I'm actually really interested in what Barbara says because so okay. much of their work is about found things. But I mean, in our case, uh, we, we use a lot of models. We try and build and test at one-to-one. -one. Um, there's a kind of, I suppose we try and do something different to this notion of architecture as traditionally um, the kind of giving very precise instructions to others through architectural drawings. And so we look for other ways to communicate that maybe um, aren't so kind of jargon heavy. So uh, models, drawings, sketches, all those kind of things. I suppose it's about what audience you're trying to talk to. So we adapt, but we have um, got into trouble a few times. A lot of our work engages with and enjoys experimental processes for producing new materials. So, you know, we've done collaborations with Granby Workshop um, to create new tiles, say, which we did for the Venice uh, Biennale a couple of years ago. And so the idea was the Biennale was a great reason to create these beautiful marbled encaustic tiles, develop it as a product for Granby, which is the expensive part of creating a new thing. Um, and they would be installed in Venice Biennale in the Italian pavilion in the main octagon. And then they would go to uh, VAC, this new gallery space in Venice, and be permanently installed. So there's this nice reuse, afterlife, longevity thing to it. But the VAC just were not expecting these tiles to be blue because we had done a sketch very early on where they all looked red. And so from this very initial sketch of what these tiles might be like, they had misread the intentionality. They'd seen it as a final design. Whereas the process had created all sorts of colors. Some were blue, some were red, some were yellow. And we had this awful moment where we had to like just make more tiles <laughs> because they weren't going to accept the, the blue ones. They felt it looked too much like a swimming pool. Um, and it all worked out fine in the end. But I think when you're very used to working with um, open-ended processes and collaborative ones, where you enjoy that experiment, you enjoy the mistake, you enjoy that aesthetic kind of spontaneity, um, and are happy with and comfortable with it, you forget that others aren't <laughs> and that representation is very important. And if you show someone something, you've got to make sure they understand it might not look like that in the end. So we're still learning. Uh, but yeah, models one to one working with the material that you're going to build it with is our preferred way of operating. Um, it sounds like that might coincide maybe with what Barbara does. Okay. <laughs> so, what about you, Barbara? Um, as I explained uh, during my presentation, is that if you build with existing material, you don't have a choice. Then you have <laughs> what you have. You have to deal with this, and you have to make the best out of it. And mm -hmm. many people are um, complaining that uh, this might cut down the creativity, but I think mm -hmm. it's the other way around. It really enhances your creativity when you are reduced to what you have and you can do the best, get the best out of it. I like what you say, Jane, is that um, you don't like to do drawings. We don't like to draw either, but um, <laughs> many times we have to. Um, but I, I loved the way to build in Africa where you just walk around and they say here and then you put your foot and you draw a line on the ground and you say now this is the wall to, going to be and then you put up the windows. Sometimes in Portugal also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but actually it's it's true that uh, actually this is a uh, this uh, simplicity that you always uh, talk refer Barbara somehow that you found in Africa and and there is also a question about the standards and which will be our standards for the next period let's say after these uh, pandemics and so on and so forth uh, of course this is all related uh, of a general understanding of uh, resources in general but it's also under it's also part of a uh, of the understanding of beauty and let's say of architecture as, as really as a kind of discipline and profession. So perhaps I, I, I would like to really to, to just to introduce this idea by Lina Bobardi regarding poor architecture. You might know the, this famous quote, but actually Lina was referring about, was talking about poor architecture as 
not in the sense of poverty, but in the sense of handicraft, expressing maximum communication and dignity through minor and humble means, which is a kind of clear, very clear stance. So following Lina's approach, do you look for a specific aesthetic in this sense? How would you define it? If you if you can, of course, play this 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 game, if you could add something more regarding this uh, situation. I think it's uh, less material you have, the more important it becomes how it looks like. And if you see the traces of use, for example, an old uh, bell, doorbell, which you have been pulled out by thousands of hands or stairs, which have really now are round in the middle where so millions of people have passed. And this is what for me is really aesthetics and not uh, all this new stuff is getting too simplistic. It has no trace of a human hand which has been touching it or which has also been making it. And I remember Wunderwasser who gave the power to his, uh, to his craftsmen and he said, you do this, these are the means you have and now you go ahead. I don't want to make the drawing for each and every balcony or each and every mosaic but you do what you imagine. And this is, for me, very important that everybody can make a contribution to a building, not only the architect. For me, the important thing is that it works for the user and that the user can say how it should look like in the interior, whereas the architect has a responsibility towards the public that the building fits into the town or into the... Mm -hmm because this is what we have to look at for the next hundred years and if it's an mm -hmm. eyesore it remains an eyesore for a hundred years when somebody wants his walls painted in pink or whatever i don't mind it's his house he has to live there i don't even have to enter the door anymore once we finish the work and i prefer even when people do this uh, decoration or whatever themselves because then they don't even need to discuss with me. I don't need to like it. They have to live in it. They have to do with what they can and what they want and what they dream of. Yeah, I think I think it, um, my understanding of kind of Lena Bovardi's um, use of Art Povera is very much about the democratization of design. Um, that design is for everybody. Um, so her interest in use of the word beauty versus the word ugly, it wasn't so much about ugly being literally about something that was ugly, but that beauty was a particular lens of the bourgeoisie. Um, and beauty was defined by those people with power, with money, um, and that ugliness isn't literal it just refers to a different lens where um, you can read perhaps um, things like craftsmanship traditions ways of working with materials that there's beauty in the ingenuity of how things have been made for need um, and I think what Lena Bobardi does very well is still retain the um, Kind of hand of the architect she is a curator so with her biggest work sure she parts of the site she gave a lot of freedom to how things were made over to the builders but she she was she was there she moved her office her studio to the site not in some sort of participatory sense but to have oversight of exactly what's happening and and a, the biggest design moves are hers and we shouldn't underestimate or undermine actually the value of our training as designers and as Barbara points to the sort of responsibility, especially across um, and skill of working across scale with materials, negotiating stakeholders um, that we don't just um, kind of in a way give over our role in that sense to people who perhaps um, we're supposed to be kind of designing for, but who we expect will somehow perform as designers themselves and say what they need. and and all of those things and it's a collaboration where um you also you don't kind of give that burden over to others as well so 
I think it's it's two things. It's about a, a different lens for understanding um, that resourcefulness has a beauty to it. Um, and I think that ties in massively to concerns uh, around um, sustainability and materiality. I think a kind of shift in, in aesthetics in architecture is kind of fundamental to um, the promotion of sustainable building, construction methods and materials. Um, but also understanding the architect or designer's role in, in creating good design, which should be open to everybody from the smallest budget to the largest budget. Mm -hmm. That's Thank my thesis you. on your you. question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I just realized that the, the last question actually is from Andre Tavares and the first one from Tiago Trigo. Sorry, because the, the name of the people is below and uh -huh. mind, sorry. So the, uh, we have just one more, uh, we have time for mm -hmm. one more. Uh, yeah, for, yes, okay. Uh, José Mateus asks you, uh, in Portugal and, and Europe in general, construction and architecture regulations are obsessively rigid in a way that in general imposes expensive predica predictable solutions. I would like to hear from Barbara, uh, he would like, <laughs> of course, uh, how she deals with this in her project and also for Jane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have one very important regulation, which is the guarantee of uh, ownership. When you have something existing, they cannot force you to pull it down, even if it does not fulfill the newest, latest mm. regulation. And that's one okay. reason more to work with the existing things and not to create mm. everything new. Because there, mm -hmm. in the, before we were more free than uh, now, and I think that's also an advantage of Switzerland that we do not follow all the German and Euro European rules and regulations, but we try to make our own, and then they are even different in all the twenty-six cantons of Switzerland. So it's a forest of rules and regulations, and you have to find your way around. And but the most important is guarantee of uh, of uh, what you have you can have it you can keep it okay yeah but as i, I said think... before the rules and regulations are if you want to follow everything you cannot build anymore it's just too expensive it's <laughs> impossible yeah, yeah. You, would, you put yourself into a prison because your balustrades have to be higher your windows have to be big but you can't open them and so on it's really horrible and i dream of a project where we take the rules the less restrictive rules of each country and make a law with combined with the less restrict, restrictive rules and leave out all which comes in addition mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> what about okay, so, yeah i mean i suppose my answer is quite simple in that it's just another design constraint you know, it's as hard and fast as the budget or the size of the site or, you know, whether you can get a certain material. It's just another thing you design with. I don't know whether, you know, how the UK compares. Um, we always complain. We're always like, you know, talking about how awful the building control guy was and how strict he is. And, you know, actually, a lot of these rules are quite open to interpretation. There are interesting solutions for everything. Um, so sometimes, actually, they're, they're opportunities. Um, and there's this really beautiful book by a uh, um, uh, architect called David Knight. The book is called Subplan, where the entire thing is looking at um, permitted development, which is a thing in the UK where you can build certain things without getting planning permission. And he creates an entire kind of like catalogue of ways in which you can subvert permitted development to do quite extraordinary things. So um, I think there's quite a lot of people who just see it as another challenge. Um, I think we're more interested in things that policies, rules, regulations that adversely affect quality so space standards in the UK, 
sizes of win minimum standards are just terrible. It, get, it allows developers to get away with horrible things like tiny windows. Um, this thing about, I think recently, 30 meters square living conditions being thought of as, you know, this development of the micro apartment as if that's like category of living. Um, uh, and so I think sometimes there are opportunities and sometimes there are things to resist and to be vocal about how terrible they are. So accept them, but also challenge them. Okay. But a very funny coincidence because we, we also have nano apartments in, in Chile, actually. 17 oh, really? square meters. Yeah. They are part of vertical ghettos in the middle, in the city's downtown is ah. quite, quite uh, unregulated. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's horrible. It's a scandal. Yeah, and I mean, what's amazing is that we have models for all of this. I think nearly every country in the world has, particularly in the post-war period in the West, extraordinary periods of building um, in really economical ways that created quality as well as the um, economy. So it's not like we don't have precedent. Um, and I think it's it's about trying to bring some of that back, which maybe should involve a bit of anarchism or political ideology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Shall we have more time, Diana, or no? Shall we? Uh, we we have we we have to to finish, but I I I want to to make one 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 little question. It's it's something like um, Cesar Vieira says that uh, the the projects are good as as if if you have good clients, okay, uh, like something like this. Uh, so I sorry, but I I I want to I want to know. The, the kind of your clients, how 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 they are, how how they how they receive these 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 ideas and and accept them. My Barbara, maybe. <laughs> I just thinking about it because we have been our own clients many times, and that helps a lot mm -hmm. because then you can also test things which you could not do with a foreigner and try out and, and build not to standard because you can allow this mm -hmm. to yourself you take the responsibility but it mm -hmm. definitely helps to have clients who appreciate your way of doing things and yes. at the moment once you are clear about how you want to proceed in a building or in a construction or in a design then the clients come who appreciate this and this makes it much more easy I wouldn't even like to build for somebody who is going for maximum profit because then I know what, what that means and I would refuse the client already. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is my point. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think maybe Barbara's practice and our practice are fortunate in that um, we can choose our clients. Um, we've yeah. always been very lucky that we've been very clear about what we do as a practice, that uh, we have a certain methodology in a way. Um, and so I think people come to us because they want to be challenged or because they see some, they can't see something and want us to kind of show them the way, which is terrible because it often means we end up talking ourselves out of work. You know, people are like, ah, I need a new building. And we're like, we look at it, we spend some time, we might create some sort of thing. And then we're like, you don't need a building you need like need a building. an artistic <laughs> director you know like it's those kind of things um mm -hmm. so uh yeah i think you know obviously clients make great projects as do great contractors great everybody and i think it's about mm -hmm. establishing and maybe it ties into this theme <laughs> just establishing common ground with everyone you work mm -hmm. with um, and going into it in a collaborative way, not an adversarial one. Um, there are always going to be challenges. You're always going to have a, a bit of a bicker, a few arguments, mm -hmm. but um, that's all kind of part of making a project better. And I think what we always say is like, the project is the most important thing, um, to focus on the work. Um, and that's what we enjoy. 
But did you did you already yeah. quit at one in the process in some process because it was there was not a common um, ground for the client or it was too difficult too challenging perhaps to to pursue the uh, project there? There have been projects that have come to a halt, but not necessarily. Um, like a few competitions have stopped because the funding's gone elsewhere or, you know, you work with public bodies, all mm -hmm. sorts of things can happen. We've never disagreed fundamentally with a client, I don't think. I can't think of a project. But in saying that, there's probably one example. It's not all roses. There are a lot of a lot of issues but I'm um, a lot of our practice is about people and networks and a lot of our projects actually come out of maybe having actually been in conversation with someone for years before a viable project is on the table and and then a lot of them become self-initiated projects with that client um, we do a lot of stuff at risk creating proposals for people because we want them to become a client um, mm -hmm. but yeah I think values are very important and it's something that we constantly talk about why would assemble do this project what are the values of the person we understand we're working for and how do they resonate with with what we feel is important um so they're all questions that are that are asked um, and disagreed upon amongst us constantly. <laughs> it's part of Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, we are constantly so, yeah. discussing then before we take on a new work, we are discussing in the team if uh, this is uh, socially feasible, if we do accept the conditions and or if we and no, many times we turned around and we said, yes, we are going to do it on the condition that and mm -hmm. miraculously the clients accepted the conditions which is great mm -hmm. not all of them we, we also lost clients but uh, we still have enough work which is quite good so felipe do, do you want to ah we have one what? more question uh, if you if you have okay. time we can be here talking for hours but uh, perhaps you can if you, um, i have many many questions actually but then I, I i prefer perhaps to you can introduce the last one for by the audience i don't know okay Sorry, and let me put this in my screen. Okay. Does does open source culture influence your meta project? This is the first question. And as a mass process, in the logic of taking care of the plant by reusing and recycling, can or should the state promote your business economic model? It's the second question. And then the, the last comment. Uh, for instance, promote massive warehouses for construction materials instead of taking them to landfills where architecture collectives would work and experiment i i, I don't i don't know if you barbara and jane understood something or perhaps the first two questions for me wasn't super clear but i don't know maybe i mean i think i think in terms of like sorry no go ahead I mean, the, the first question seems quite clear about open source. Um, I think that's really great. And we often talk about sharing our knowledge um, and wanting to share that knowledge um, and creating things that can, you know, building that into the design process. So, so creating something with the intention of sharing it. Um, I think open source design is something we haven't really you know and using i mean we're quite analog really annoyingly analog as a practice uh, i think digital technologies the kind of power of um uh kind of digital fabrication and and sharing things that can be um, fabricated through kind of off open source software and things is is something that i think we really support the kind of ideology behind it um but uh that's, I suppose, just a sort of affirmative <laughs> answer to the question. Um, wasn't quite sure about the second part of the question, though. So, sorry, I can't answer that. Mm -hmm. uh, the last one from Inez Azevedo that asks, 
Jane talked about organizing labor in the construction field. My question is, how do these two practices approaches the issue of organizing immaterial labor in their offices? Are the working conditions of their employees an important issue to them? Planet instead of land? <laughs> I'm sorry, planet instead of head is another, another question. Sorry, it's not related to the. <laughs> I'm sorry. Two people, two different people. So, Jane, talk is about organizing uh, labor on uh, the construction field. Yeah. The question is how. I mean, I probably. How, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I probably talked about it loads. Labor is really important to us. Our first projects were all about flash mobbing a site to make something happen using free labor. But it's very important to underline the self-initiated nature of that, the um, movement of and distribution of capital across that project was um, amongst a very loose, undefined set of people where ownership of the project was by those who built it. Um, and the products of that were shared. Uh, this moment when there was a collective sense that um, we would take on commissions, where there was a more formal relationship, where there was funding. Um, from the outset, we've been very clear that all of our projects uh, pay good salaries to um, everyone involved and that they're all independent um, of each other. So. Um, yeah, like the, the kind of um, working conditions, I would say, of our studio um, is really important. And now that we have, I suppose we just, we, most people wouldn't actually, I, I'm quite picky about this, but like we are a collective, but we are a closed collective. We are a group of individuals who are partnerships of a business with seven employees who will have access to becoming part of a collective, which involves responsibility to the business. Um, and we work collectively, but collectivity as an idea is something that I think we need to work on. This kind of free flowing sharing of everything that we have as a resource is, is maybe not quite there. So we're very conscious that within a collective, we actually have a hierarchy, a very clear hierarchy. And what does that mean for, um, junior staff members who don't have that same relationship to the practice as um, those who've been in it from the beginning? And, and what would it mean to, to participate um, at the same level? So, so um, we're always talking about those things, equitable hiring practices, fair hiring practices, um, creating um, platforms. We have a lot of like working groups around gender, around diversity, around other identity categories that that we unfortunately have to negotiate uh, within these very crass terms, but um, it's constantly talked about within our practice. And I think Assemble, Assemble isn't this weird independent entity. Assemble is the people who are in it. Um, so we're very people centered. And I hope that was clear maybe from the presentation, how much emphasis is put on, on the kind of culture and value individuals get from their experience working um, with us and within the practice itself. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, just to speak more broadly to the industry, people don't recognize the value of their own labor enough and obviously participate in the myth of a meritocracy. Um, and I think demanding better labor practices for architects internationally is a huge issue. Um, and it's a scandal mm -hmm. that the British system doesn't have a union. We, we're we very good at unions and I don't know why the architecture industry doesn't have one. I don't know what it's like in other countries so much. Do you want yes. to add something, Barbara? Yeah, maybe in our case, it's more a feeling of a family that we think we, we are treating everybody equal and we also open up the way now that uh, juniors can become partners. We are already nine partners, but we want to be more. And we are also trying to really give equal salaries and to 
have a transparent salary system, which is very unusual in Switzerland. Yeah. And yeah. what we really like is that people do not work only on a computer screen, but they go out on mm -hmm. the construction site and that they do things by their own hands. So not all of them like to do this or not all of them are able. For example, we built the two floors, the two additional floors in our office, we built them ourselves. And the amazing thing was that people who have been only drawing in our office, they came from a craftsman um, education and they showed their qualities suddenly, which they never spoke of. And when we started <laughs> to build it, metal beams, then they showed and they say, hey, but why don't you do it this way? And we say, but how do you know? And yeah, I've learned this. And yeah. that was great, a very great experience. But it's, it's yeah. a big effort also. It takes a lot of time. It doesn't cost less if than if you build it with craftsmen. But it's the ownership which is important, that mm -hmm. people think they have made their own office and their own working place. And that's also when they stay and they like to introduce the young ones. And we have apprenticeships uh, quite every two at a time, always in, in both offices, so more four. And which I think is very important. We also mix the young and the olders all around. Yeah. I want to be seconded to your office. <laughs> we do a great or something. Yeah, exactly. Like, I come to you to assemble for half a year. I think I think it's a win-win for assemble. <laughs> yeah, for us too. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> no, but, but, but even though you, you were saying, Jane, that the, some, somehow you are running a conventional practice on the one side of, OK, of course, we can agree on, on this. You, you, you Somehow you have the goals of a conventional practice. But there are, in this the last commentary, we the let's say a, a kind of let's say an alternative attitude and that you have been spending time designing the practice also and the protocols and the and the conditions within the the an architectural practice which is something very appealing and that that we could hopefully we can continue talking in a yeah. next uh, opportunity yeah no i think quickly yeah. to add to that is that um the the uh practice model is always evolving it's not like day one we're like we're a collective and this is how it works it literally looks different this month to how it looked last month like it changes and has been changing over 10 years that much and so i think um you know the biggest projects is the way you work um in many senses um mm -hmm. so it's great to be able to hear other models uh firsthand and take some of those learnings back to our own <laughs> our own studio. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have to finish. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> we want to thank you very much uh, to Vibrant Jane for those uh, inspiring presentations. I, I think it was very 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 good all of this session. A very generous thanks to to trace the the way of this this first common field conference thank you so much uh, and thank you to all the public uh, for the questions and yeah. so on and then i have to announce that we will back on december 10th at 6 30 in this same channel with dogma and h architect uh, with the conference entitled New Housing Models and Architecture Without Status. See you there. Bye. Thank you again. And sorry, but we have to finish. <laughs> Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.